that's an old one, but it is so refreshing. It is a song we sing directly to the Lord. Some call them prayer songs, some vertical praise songs, but it is a song directed to the Lord. I want you to always pay attention to the song uh, and how it's presented and how it's sung. I want you to have a little what we call cerebral Christianity. Don't just mindlessly sing what's up on the screen, but get into it. Amen? Amen. Let it mean something to you. And if we're singing a song that's to each other, you see me walking around and getting in people's faces when I sing and worship. There are songs that we sing to one another. The Bible says singing songs to one another, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So the songs we sing to the Lord are not better songs or greater songs or the Bible tells us to do both. We are the body of Christ. Sing to one another. Look them in the eye and say, God is good. Look at somebody and say, miracles happen when we pray. We don't have to tell the Lord that. We, he knows that. Amen? Woo! Tell somebody else sometimes the words to some of these songs. Amen? I had scheduled uh, another minister, a pastor, to be with us today, and I canceled him because I felt like the Lord put a word in my spirit for today. And uh, he was fine with that. He had plenty of other things going on and needed that time, actually. But, and that's just God, right? However, uh, I feel like somebody here today needs to hear about the promises of God. And it, the Lord just dropped it in my spirit, and every day it seemed like a, there was a confirming word that come would come. And I told Paul, I said, I got to, this is not for the 27th, this is for Sunday, the 20th. So, here we are today, and here I am, and you get to look at my face for the next little while, okay? I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to some people, and you, you hear preachers say, uh, Isaiah, just bring me down just a little bit. I, I want to scream and shout, and I don't want to blow them out. Isn't he doing a great job back there? Yeah. Give, nobody gives the sound man a hand, but he deserves a hand. I love it. And we've got a great group of people. I tell you, they've worked hard this week, and uh, we've, we've increased some of our uh, scope of what we do here uh, visually and speakers and different things installed this week, and I thank God for that. So my wife wants to talk. She loves y'all, and it's our anniversary, so she can just tell you whatever she I wants to I put up with 41 years. I should get the microphone every now and then. No, when Debbie was talking, it was in my heart to share something. Bring that baby up here without a blanket. And see, he does what I say, too. See, they all just, they all just, just jump when I, they just say how high when I say jump. A few weeks ago, the same thing happened, and I missed the opportunity. But Lindsay is a miracle as well. Oh, man. Four years of desiring and praying for a baby, and the doctors had said, you're, we're going to need to start. If you really want one, you're going to need, it's not possible, you're going to need to start doing something to aid it, to help it along. And uh, I was about ready to go there, but God. And after, after we had her, we wanted more. But God thought we had enough. And that's okay. But I wanted to share with you that this little 
this little baby is wearing the first dress, Lindsay's dress, the first dress she ever wore to church. She's wearing that today. A few weeks back, she wore another little tiny dress that was the first gift that was given to us uh, as a baby girl dress. So in a few weeks, you may see her wear a couple of others. I saved a bunch of them, but they're not all in style. They're not all in style, but this one was uh, stood the test of time, and my baby girl, my baby granddaughter has it on today. I'm thankful to the Lord for what he's given us through the, for, the, for the generations. It's not for us. It's really for the generations. The generations need Lindsay's. The generations need Selah's and Simeon's and, and your grandbabies. It's for the generations. It's for the those that are out there who need them, and we're grateful to God for the for the way he's going to use our grandbabies in the kingdom. Did I do good? Good. I didn't embarrass you? Not really. You never embarrassed me. Oh, that was so good. (laughs) Don't raise your hand if you're wearing a 36-year-old outfit. (laughs) You look so young in that shirt. Huh. It's... It's rough when all your grandkids can ha- have his hand-me-downs, isn't it? Isn't that awful? No, I love that. I love what we're doing with the generations, and it's it's a tie-in. <clears throat> as as I was saying, uh, <laughs> how many of you remember the old song "Standing on the Promises"? One of the lines is, standing on the promises that cannot fail. I want to stand on something that cannot fail. Look at somebody and say, where are you standing? Where are you standing? So over the last week, um, I've been gone a couple of weeks, so uh, maybe two weeks Uh, There are some people in our congregation who've been through some stuff and have a testimony. And if you uh, see them, if you don't know them, introduce yourself. If you do know them, um, pray for them and and let them share with you some of the things that God is doing. But uh, just in the last week or so, uh, Chuck Wellman has been through a battle. And uh, God is healing his eyes his body and amen but uh he lost sight in both eyes for for a little while but god God. amen he he's got one of them restored i believe your right eye is still good hallelujah amen uh I know mention has been made of our precious Diane Geisinger, um, but my brother Tom uh, is here today, and he's had a rough few weeks, but especially this past week, and I know a lot of prayers have been going up for him, and I wanted to mention him today, and um, Daniel was cleaning up our big party three weeks ago, and strained a muscle and had surgery and he's wearing a cast but thank god for you persevering and you're going to be all right amen we love you amen hallelujah give god praise jane wave at everybody jane hansen is here today you've been praying for jane she took a dive out of her camper and (laughs) wow Um, it's a miracle that she wasn't really 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 hurt bad and I know it was rough but we're not trying to diminish what did happen it it hurt but God he kept us and we are thankful for her and uh, I looked out today and uh, Phil and Mary have been going through a, a battle prayer times and intercession and uh, I just hope the congregation will surround them and love them and keep them in your prayers they got a testimony in the making but God but God but God amen 
Amen. Anybody else had a rough few days? Just raise your hand. Look at there. See, you're not alone. There's battles going on. People are in the trenches fighting. Somebody say, but God. But I come to tell you today that in this room, while we were worshiping and praying, God did something for Randy. Wave, Randy. And there's that big smile. He didn't have that smile when he came in here a few weeks ago. He said, I don't know why I keep coming here. <laughs> he said, but I drive like I'm hauling eggs during the week. And on Sunday, I'm running stop signs to get to this place. <laughs> Glory to God. Today, right over there, Randy accepted the Lord Jesus, gave his life to the Lord, repented of his sin, found salvation. Hallelujah! It's worth it all! It's worth it! It's worth the battle. It's worth the fight. Keep up the fight. Amen? Amen. And I know the, the uh, Hannah and the children mentioned our anniversary, but I want to honor Paula. You know, I know a lot you don't know. I see her day after day after day. I know when she gets on that keyboard in pain. I know when she gets up and gets dressed for church and don't feel like it. Most people would just call in sick. But I remember... 41 years ago, on Sunday mornings when we weren't the pastors, and she still got up sick and went to the house of God and led a choir, led worship, played the keyboard, sang her guts out to do what God has called her to do. And I see her get up on Wednesday morning and come into this church and pray for three hours for you, for me for other pastors, for our other campuses, for the missions work that we have around the globe and the missionaries we support in Belize and all around the, the world, Nepal, New Zealand, uh, Lithuania, and the roots that we're putting down in, in the spirit realm in Indiana and Kentucky and Michigan and the prisons. Amen? And we just, I love her. She has been everything to me. And I thank you, Paula, for being you and loving me. Amen. I told you we're going to talk about the promises, and here we go. Now, I probably won't have time to give you a bunch of promises that God has given to you. But how many of you have a promise? Have, if you, do you write down your promise from the Lord? Do you have a promise from the scripture that you put on your dashboard or your mirror? You have a promise. Most Christians have something that they consider to be, this is my promise from the Lord. I have promises that I just hold on to. What I want to do today, and this is my, my quest with you today, is to show you the faithfulness of God to his promises. And then we can take that and you can go and list a thousand promises on your own. Would you do that? Would you do that? I, I, I remember a, a, a minister talking one time about uh, fleshing out the message. It, if I studied taxidermy. Y'all didn't know I studied taxidermy, but when I was a teenager, I thought I wanted to be a taxidermist, so I ordered a kit in the mail, and, and I practiced it, and thought I was terrible at it. <laughs> but the animals were dead. It's okay. <laughs> they had already died. Anyway. But... 
you start with a skeleton and you flesh it out. You put something on it. Usually it's clay or some, something like that to give it body. Then you put the skin back on it and all that. Well, sometimes when I preach to you, what I'd like for you to do is take the skeleton, the framework of what I give you, and then you go flesh it out, build on it, turn it into the body of, of what it should be, okay? So don't, don't think of the messages, the teaching, the preaching, the scriptures as the whole picture. It's, it's something for you to build on. Take your Bible and read the rest of it. I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but you need to see those scriptures in context. You don't just need to blurt out scriptures if you don't know what the context was. Context is important, right? Amen. God's promises are all in context. They don't just blanket rule everything and everybody. We say God loves everybody. Well, he does, but it, there's context to that. Amen? Everybody don't have a loving relationship with God. Now, the world and, you know, the enemy's trying to make everybody think that everybody's going to heaven and you know, they, uh, all souls are saved and all this kind of nonsense. But that's not true, and it's not in, in the context of Scripture. There's conditions attached to a relationship with God. My marriage of 41 years is strong because of the conditions of the covenant. And if I keep my end and she keeps her end and we keep promises to each other, the marriage will last and become stronger. So what is a promise? Let's start there. Webster says in the noun form of a promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen it's also a verb and the verb form means to assure someone that one will definitely do give or arrange something undertake or declare that something will happen remember when you were kids and you say that's not a threat that's a promise remember that i believe we're in a time right now and the warfare of the spirit where the church of the living God needs to get a decree and a declaration on our heart and in our mouth to let the enemies of this kingdom know this is not a threat this is a promise Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Amen. That's a promise. Yes. Every knee will bow. That's a promise. The workers of iniquity will be destroyed. That's a promise. Yes. Yes. Turn to Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, the words of the weeping or the lamenting prophet says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. By his mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction, the New, Life, New Living Translation says, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. By his mercies, we are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Let that soak into your spirit this morning. In Genesis chapter 8, 
the earth had just gone through the trauma of the ages. The lands, the mountains, the livestock, the fish, the trees, and all of humanity was consumed in a flood, the great flood. There are fossils of fish in Arizona. You can't explain that because there was no fish eating smaller fish and carcasses falling to the bottom of an ocean in Arizona. It had to be a sudden, quick flooding and receding of water. Amen? The earth was in trauma. Noah and his sons and their wives exited the ark and... What do you think? I mean, if you ever struggle with fear, it's probably because something happened to you that was trauma to you. If you were ever in a bad car wreck and the car was coming from the right side, you kind of see something on your right and you flinch for a little bit. Right? Well, if you just came out of a flood... And a cloud pops up, you might get to thinking bad thoughts. I mean, right? <laughs> Honey, what'd you do with that ark? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So Genesis 8.21 reads, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. And here's the verse that I claim as a promise. Whenever there's a shortage on food or toilet paper or whatever, right? This is my verse, okay? I'm going to this one. This is my promise, okay? While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. I'm hanging on to that because I like harvest. Amen. Amen. I like to know that if I plant, I'm going to get something to eat. Butter beans are hard to pick. It's a lot of work to keep a garden. But as long as the earth stands, as long as the earth remains, you will have gardens if you plant and you Keep the weeds up. Amen? Amen. Now, there are always situations where people fear the promise. It's like you've heard the saying, it's too good to be true. I'm as skeptical as anybody when I walk on to buy something big, you know, like furniture or a car or house or whatever I'm about as skeptical as they come of the salesman I, I, and if you're a salesman in here praise God we need good salesmen we need Holy Ghost filled honest salespeople. and I'm not scared of you but I I'm a little skeptical because not every promise is kept and the fine print Let's, you know who the most skeptical people are? Lawyers. <laughs> Hello? They, I got a friend who's a lawyer, and he, he wants everything in writing. He wants triplicate. He wants to call, you know, call dial a prayer and 
check everybody and everything out. Am I getting ripped off? We're skeptical, aren't we? We, we don't want to be ripped off, and, and God knows there's plenty of people out there. How many of you answer your phone every, every time it rings with every number you don't recognize? Please don't raise your hand, my God. <laughs> Paul says, aren't you going to answer that? I go, nope. I answered one the other day, and they went right into telling me how I'd been frauded and blah, 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 blah. And I hung up on them, and she said, you should have stayed on there and told them no. <laughs> Maybe I should, but I'm skeptical. I don't think they were real. I don't think they really were who they said they were. You know what I mean? Joshua might have been one of those guys. Because, you know, in, in Scripture, I think Joshua was the one guy that God had to tell over and over and over, be not afraid, fear not. And I always wondered what he was scared of. And look at ver, uh, chapter 14 of Joshua, verse 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but... My brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. See, COVID, it wasn't the first time that somebody tried to frighten God's people from doing what they were called to do from obeying what God sent us to do. It was a test, and, and I was afraid, and you were too. Don't act like you didn't ever get afraid of anything. We were all scared for a minute. Amen? Some more than others. Some responded different than others, but we were tested. I think we did pretty doggone good. Amen? And, and next time, we'll do a whole lot better, won't we? Amen. But these spies went out there and tried to put fear in the heart of the people to accept and receive and possess what God had promised them. They said, uh, you know, Joshua and Caleb were saying, man, look at these grapes. Look at this milk and this honey and woohoo, this is going to be awesome. And these other 10 spies were saying, you better be scared to death. This is too good to be true. This is, there's no way this is happening. Amen? And God's promises sometimes are so good, it scares us. I mean, that's how we need to understand God's goodness. It's so good that we just, uh, man... It's hard to believe it's going to be that good. But I have a saying I want to put on the wall here somewhere. It really can be this good. Yes. Amen. So Numbers 23, I think we can understand our God and how he intends what he intends for his people. Numbers 23 and verse 6. So Balaam returned and found the king standing beside his burnt offerings and all the officials of Moab. This was the message Balaam delivered. Balak summoned me to come from Aram. The king of Moab brought me from the eastern hills. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come and announce Israel's doom. But how can I curse those whom God has not cursed. How can I condemn those whom the Lord has not condemned? I see them from the clifftops. I watch them from the hills. I see the people who live by themselves set apart from other nations. Who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as dust? Who can count even a fourth of Israel's people? Let me die like the righteous. Let my life end like theirs. Then King Balak demanded of Balaam, 
What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies. Instead, you blessed them. But Balaam replied, I will speak only the message that the Lord puts in my mouth. Somebody said, amen. Somebody said earlier, complaining is the language of fear and the enemy. Praise is the language of heaven and faith. Amen? Amen. I will only speak what the Lord puts in my mouth. Now, when you get that one conquered, we're going somewhere. Amen? Amen. Y'all pray for me and I'll pray for you. Numbers 23, 18. Skip right down to 18. This was the message Balaam delivered. Rise up, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, I received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. No misfortune in his, is in his plan for Jacob. No trouble in store for Israel. For the Lord their God is with them. He has been proclaimed their king. God brought them out of Egypt. For them, he is as strong as a wild ox. No curse can touch Jacob. No magic has any power in Israel. For now it will be said of Jacob, what wonders God has done for Israel. These people rise up like a lioness, like a majestic lion rousing itself. They refuse to rest until they have feasted on prey, drinking the blood of the slaughtered. Then Balak said to Balaam, fine, but if you won't curse them, at least don't bless them. The enemy's backing down. He's compromised. He's ready to compromise. I love it when the enemy is so scared. When we start to get an upper hand, and I feel some traction in the spirit, in the world that we live in. I I believe we're starting to shine forth. I believe the church of the living God is about to rise up in ways that hasn't been seen in years and years, maybe never. Amen? Amen. But Balaam replied to Balak, didn't I tell you? I can only do what the Lord tells me. Now in, in chapter 24, verse 3, This is the message he delivered. This is the message of Balaam, son of Beor, the message of the man whose eyes see clearly, the message of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob! How lovely are your homes, O Israel! They spread before me like palm groves, like gardens by the riverside. They are like tall trees planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their offspring have all they need. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. For them, he is as strong as a wild ox. He devours all the nations that opposed him, breaking their bones in pieces, shooting them with arrows. Like a lion, Israel crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to arouse her. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, O Israel, and cursed is everyone who curses you. Oh, get ready, church of the living God. Let the kingdom of God arise. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Blessing. To those who bless you. Amen? It's a promise of God. Numbers 23 and 19 again. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not a human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? No. No. Never. He's never failed. He's never failed, and he never will. Amen. Amen. 
He put his rainbow in the sky as a promise. It's a sign. When you see it, just remember, his promises are true. He's in covenant with you as he was with Moses and David and Jeremiah. He is in covenant with you the same as he was with Jesus. Amen? We are in that covenant with him. God's nature is to love, to bless, and to keep. Jeremiah 29, 11. Does everybody know that one? He's truth. He cannot lie. But how many of you ever read Jeremiah 29, 10? Get it in context, okay? Let's, uh, let's do that. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but... Then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. That, that's hard to hear when you're in bondage. That's hard to hear when things aren't going well. Amen? But God, in context, these folks were in bad trouble. But God gave them a promise. A promise. A promise. He said it's a promise to bless you. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your own land. In their time, it was about geography. In our time, it's about a spiritual returning to the landmarks, to the beginning of things. Amen? When the founders of this nation cried out to God and prayed and declared and decreed, God began to move in this land. Before there was even a thought of independence or even a thought of our constitution. Somebody stood on the shores of this nation and prayed and prophesied yes. and blessed. Yes. Read about Cape Henry. Read about St. Augustine. Read about the crosses placed on our eastern shores and read about how they begin to lead the Native Americans to Jesus and tell them about his love, a never-ending love, an eternal love, a self-sacrificing love that they no longer had to do the rituals and the things that they thought they had to do to please God. They no longer had to live under superstition. They no longer had to see God the way they saw him, but he would come to them. Amen? He's not just a great spirit. He's the one true and living God, the creator of all things. Amen? Amen. Jesus is his name, and he died and he rose again for you and for me. And that gospel message was preached and planted in 1609 and 1630s and all through our history, it's woven in, and we are living in a time when we begin to declare and decree and preach and prophesy and speak and call forth those words that were spoken over this nation. God wants to bring, hey, his promises are true. Has he ever, ever lied? Don't let what you see make you think that God's given up on you or on this community or on America or on the inner cities, inner city. Or, amen? He hasn't given up on his people. Of all stripes, of all colors, of all parties, God is God. And he will redeem what he has said he will redeem. He will save. He will heal. It's up to us. To proclaim it, declare it, decree it. Promise. Not a threat, a promise. Yes. A promise. Yes. Amen. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. 
unto the glory of God by us. How is his promises going to be carried out? By us. See, we're not supposed to be some cul-de-sac sitting here with our arms out. Give me, Lord. Give me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Give me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Give me, Lord. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Too many panhandler Christians. Come on, Lord. Fill my cup. Give me it. Oh, Lord, today I, I left my cup at home. I brought a bucket. I really need something, Lord. Give me, give me, give me. I don't know why the Lord don't bless me like he blessed my neighbor. His promises are for us to enact, for us to implement, for us to decree and declare. He wants to bless the earth by us. If he makes you rich, it's not so you can build a bigger house, put up more fences, corner yourself in somewhere, buy more condos. He wants to make you rich so you can be a blessing and enact and carry out his promises to the whole earth. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's okay to say, God, make me rich. It's all right for you to prosper yeah. and have wealth. How else are you going to give it away? How else is the kingdom of God going to take over the earth? We've got to fight. We've got to win. We've got to rise up above our mentality of just begging God to get through one more day. Oh, God. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are blessed and highly favored. The promises of God are yea, and they are in him. Amen. What does that mean? That word is V-I-A, the word yea in the Greek, a primary particle of strong affirmation. Yes, even so, surely, truth, verily, yea and yes. Give me a, a nod. Yes. Yes. Sometimes I look at Simeon and I say, Simeon, you need to get a yes in your spirit. Right? We need a yes in our When somebody says something, we need a yes. Amen. The promises of God are true. Yes. Promises of God are true. Amen. Amen, yes. That's how you apprehend it. That's how you get the promises of God. You've got to respond. When God drops a promise in your spirit, just reach up a hand and go, yes, Lord. Yes. Woo. Hey. Amen. Yes. Woo. You read Jeremiah 29, 11, just dance a little jig on. Woo. Celebrate in front of the devil. Make him mad. He don't own the dance. What are you talking about? My God, it, that's one of my pet peeves, is to look at the world partying. <laughs> and look at the church partying. God is holy. Look at somebody and say, we're going to party hard. Hey! I don't see in Scripture where there's recliners in heaven. Who, who in here was a party animal? Don't deny it. Doug, what was your peak partying age? Huh? Today? 
today. All right. All right. That's how old you're going to be in heaven. Whatever your peak partying age is, that's how old you're going to be in heaven. Hey. Say, man, when I was 22, I was, I was wild. That's how old you're going to be in heaven. Whatever your peak partying age is. I don't have scripture for that. I just think it sounds awesome. <laughs> Amen. I know we're not going to be old and our feet's not going to hurt and our back's not going to hurt. We're not going to have high blood pressure. We're not going to have a high cholesterol. We're not going to have diabetes. Hey, we're going to party. The promises of God are yes and amen. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Hey, you act like what you believe. If you believe in a party in God, you act like it. If you believe God is boring, you act like it. Amen? I've been around 63 years, and I know God, and I ain't never seen him boring. Amen? He never sleeps or slumbers. That's a party in God right there. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't have time to read all the scriptures, but in John chapter 14, God, through Jesus, made a promise. It's a promise kept. In John 14, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to go away, but don't let your heart be troubled. I'm coming again. He promised them, I will return and send my Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. He's going to come to you. I've been with you, <laughs> but I shall be in you. It's a promise. It's a promise. Woo! And them folks that say it's not for you today, they're a bunch of liars. I know that's not nice to say, but I haven't studied a lot of other words. I need to, I need to go to college and get some fancy words. The media can, you know, they can twist it around and make it sound pretty. But it is a promise for you. Acts chapter 2 said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the apostles and a, another 108 people, amen, were in one place in one mind in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and suddenly there appeared unto them cloving tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Look at somebody and say, that was the Holy Ghost that Jesus promised. And then down in verse 39, it said, for the promise, somebody say promise, promise. is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hey! Don't let anybody tell you that promise is not kept. Don't let anybody tell you that the promise is not for you. Don't let anybody rob you of a promise that God has made for you. It is your promise and your children and the generations after them. Anybody in here have children who do not have the Holy Ghost? Raise your hand. Look at look how many is about to get the Holy Ghost that we weren't planning on. Hey! Oh, I'm excited now. Whew, that's about 150 people. That's a good revival, Miss Lois. Woo! Okay, I gotta close. 
Chad, how long do you think it'll take me to close? <laughs> okay. Seven promises to seven churches in the Revelation. You want to hear those? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how many of you have read the second and third chapter of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? So you know it starts out with John getting a word, the Lord speaking a word through John, to the seven churches of Asia. And these churches were named by their city because back then there wasn't religious competition among the churches and people weren't divided because one had grape juice for communion and the other one had real wine. People weren't divided over baptisms and, you know, all that stuff. Right? It was one church. It was the church at Ephesus. I don't know how many campuses they had. I don't know how many homes they met in. I don't know how, if they had a building or no building or a bunch of buildings. But they were the church at Ephesus, okay? And so they got a letter through John that you better straighten up your act. This was the church. And he gives them correction, and then he ends it with the promise. I'm not going to deal much with the corrections right now because we've got limited time. Ephesus, he said, you've... You've done a lot of great things, but you've left your first love. It, you backslid. You're not where you once were. It was a bad season for Ephesus. They left their first love. But listen, he gave them a promise. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh. So if you repent, you overcome. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That first love that you left, I'm going to restore it. In ways you can't imagine. I'm going to make you to eat of the tree of life. That's, that's love like you ain't. Whoo! We're going to restore that love. Smyrna, number two church. They were found guilty of blasphemy. He says to them, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is if you, if you repent. Okay? He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. See, blasphemy would get you killed. But the promise was greater. The promise always overcomes the accusation. The promise is always better than you thought it was. Pergamos. They've been eating things offered to idols and hanging out with people eating things offered to idols and that was condemned strongly. He says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that uh, receiveth it. <laughs> You've been eating things offered to idols. Repent. And I'll show you my promise for you is greater than how you've messed up. Don't dwell on your mess up. Amen? Thyatira, you've been letting Jezebel take, take over. The power of manipulation, getting, gain, trying to gain power through manipulation and deception and seduction. Jezebel's spirit can be nasty. It gets to working in a church. Give it no place. When you, when you smell, sniff, don't go blabbing it. That's what she wants. Amen? Just don't give it any place. Just put that out. Nip it in the bud. Revelation 2.26 says, He that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end. This is to Thyatira, the one that had been letting Jezebel rule and give, take power. He says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron and the vessels of a potter that shall be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. I will give him the morning star. They have been getting power through manipulative means. And God said, you get repent of that and I will give you rule. Wow. The very thing that they tried to get and gain and their evil God promises to them. Sardis, church number five. He says, you've defiled your garments. 
Revelation 3 and 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. You've got a promise. You defiled your garments, but I'm going to make you a promise when you get to the other side of it. Philadelphia, he said, you have little strength. Here's what he's going to give a promise to the church of little strength. I will make, a, make you a pillar. <laughs> Woo! You say, oh, pastor, I don't know if I could lead that. I'm, I'm not a strong leader. Listen for a promise. I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him a new name. That's what the promise of God can do for you. Laodicea, church number seven. Y'all all know about Laodicea, right? We hear, we've heard that. They were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm, just always wanting to straddle the fence, monkeying around in the middle of no good for anything. The Lord said, I'm going to spew you out. Some translations say vomit. But yeah, Laodicea, you make me sick. Right? Here's what he says. He, he gives them a promise. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. I wanted to spew you out, but I promise you, if you'll repent. I'll give you exactly what, what made me sick. I want to bring in and put you in my bosom. I'm going to let you sit in my throne with me. You, you're going to be closer than close. Remember Peter? In Jerusalem, there, I'm speaking to somebody right now in the spirit. You're, you're in a place right now. You need to hear this. In, in Jerusalem, there's a church called the Church of the Rooster. It's a church dedicated to the incident where Peter denied the Lord. Now, if I ask you, and you hadn't heard that, what you think about when you think of Peter, you would not ever say, he denied the Lord. We just don't think. I hope you wouldn't. You think of Peter, you think about, you know, the day of Pentecost. You know, sac martyr for the Lord and on and on and on, the great things Peter accomplished. But they built a church and they put a gold rooster on the top of the spire in Jerusalem and it's called the Church of the Rooster. Reminding everybody that Peter failed. You ever feel like people remind you of your failures? You ever feel like what people know you by is your failures? It's human, isn't it? It's natural for us to think of it that way. What did Jesus do? He looks at Peter and he says, You're going to deny me, you're going to fail. He's like, oh, Lord, no, 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 no. Why would Jesus do that? So he could give him a promise. You're going to fail. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait around the corner. I'm going to be over here on this side. When you, when you get done with all that nonsense, when you get done failing me, when you, when you finally denied me three times before the crow, when the crow crows, when the rooster crows, the cock crows, not a crow, a rooster, two different birds. Crows don't crow, roosters crow, crows caw. Why couldn't they make it simple and let crows crow and roosters do something else? I don't know. The English language, Tad, we, we got a battle, don't we? You know what Jesus did? Peter, warming by the fire, cussing. I don't know Jesus. A few days later, 
Jesus raised from the dead shows up to Peter, he builds a fire. Peter sees the fire and he goes, oh, no. His olfactory nerves bring back the memory of that night at the fire. He don't know what Jesus is going to say. Jesus says, hey, Peter, he's feeling so much shame, the smell, the thought, the memory, bitter, bitter, bitter time. Jesus says, hey, Peter, I made you breakfast. Peter gets a little teared up. <sighs> Only Jesus will make breakfast for one who denied him. Only Jesus would anoint and bless this failure of a disciple. Betrayed him, turned his back on him, walked away, wasn't there when he needed him, raised him up. Put him in the pulpit on the day of Pentecost. Gave him the message, the keys to the kingdom. You got to love a God like that. You got to love a God who keeps his promises. After you've tested Peter, after you've been tried, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to use you like no other mouthpiece for me, for my love, for my glory, for my kingdom. Stand to your feet if you would. Of all the promises I ever made, the greatest promise I ever made was 56 years ago, right about there on an altar in my little church in Mississippi, I made a promise to follow Jesus all the days of my life. I've kept that promise. I've not been perfect at it. There's been days I've questioned it. There have been times that I've slipped and failed, but I've kept my eyes on him for 56 years. Second greatest promise I ever made was 41 years ago on this day, a Friday night at 7.30 Central Time. I promised to love this lady right here, to cherish keep, provide, love, and I have loved her. I haven't been perfect at it. I've slipped and failed. I've had to repent, apologize, but God, I kept my promise. He kept his promise. My favorite promise from the Lord is that I will never leave you. I don't know about you. I, I, I'm not much of a loner. I don't, I don't like to be alone. Simeon senses that, and he he stays close to me. He he, don't, he sees me walking out in the yard. He runs out and goes with me a lot of times. You know, the night we were working on the volunteer party, and I decided to take the mule over there so we'd have a way to ride around the ballpark. Simeon hopped up in there with me and it started pouring down rain. We don't have a windshield on it. Oh, Papa, Papa, Papa. I got to ride with Sweetie. Let me out. <laughs> and we were, I mean, we're doing 25 miles an hour in, in the rain. You know, it's, it's not fun. I pulled over. I said, come on, let's go get in the car with Sweetie. He said, no, Papa, I don't want to ride with Sweetie now. I want to ride with you. I said, come on, you can, you can ride with Sweetie, it's okay. He said, Papa, I can't let you go through this alone. <laughs> so my, my promise from the Lord is that he will never leave me alone. He won't. He won't leave you alone. I come here today to tell somebody He's promised to love you. 
from the message, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 12 through 15. And this is what will happen. It's a promise. When you on your part will obey these directives, keeping and following them, God on his part will keep the covenant of loyal love that he made with your ancestors. He will love you. He will bless you. He will increase you. It's a promise. I promise. I promise. We've all been victims of a broken promise. We've all broken promises. No need for us to pretend. We, we're real people. We're human. But God, the God we serve, the reason we're here, has never gone back on a promise that he made. Now, how could he love me? I've been so mean. I've been bad. I've treated people wrong. How could he ever love me? I don't know how he does it, but I promise you, you're not too bad. You're not too mean. You're not too nasty, dirty. There's nothing so dirty that he can't make worthy. He's not a man that he would lie. There's somebody here that needs his love. That's all I can say is you, you need his love. You just need to be loved on by God. Nothing's going to do that for you. Nothing. Not a relationship, not a chemical, not an activity, not a job, not, no amount of money, no amount of popularity. Nothing will do for you what the love of Jesus will do. It's not going to happen. So why are you looking in all the wrong places? If you want love, you can find it right here, right here. As the ushers and elders and deacons are coming to assist us in our prayer time, I want to invite you to step out with them and walk to the front of this room. Come on, all the deacons, elders, make your way down. Step out with them. You want to, you want to know love. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Love like you've never known it. It's a promise. And it's a promise kept. Woo! Oh, be loved on by God today. Let him love you. Let him love you. Let him love you. Step out of that seat. Receive his love. Abundant love. Grace and mercy. His mercies are new every morning. Woo! Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jesus. Step out of your seat. If you want to know Jesus' love, come to this front. Come. Come and let Jesus love on you. Just come and experience real love. Maybe the love is waning out of your relationships. Maybe with your children, there's a lack of love. 
a lack of love in the earth, in your relationship, in your world. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you need a healing touch from him today. Whatever you need, I invite you to come. Come to the front of this room. His face shine for you. Be gracious to the Lord. Turn his face towards you and give you. Amen. to you. Take the hand of the person next to you as these up front are praying. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that your promises are yes and amen. We thank you, Lord, that your word never fails. You have kept your promises with us and you love us and you will always love us. Let that love saturate this room. Let every heart in this place sense and feel and know that you are with us them in their storm, in their trial, in their situation, those that have lost a loved one this week, be with them now, Lord, comfort their heart, be the comforter, the Holy Ghost with them right now. We thank you, Jesus, for your comfort and your strength and your love in this room. We bless you, Lord. We love you. We honor you. You are a miracle working God. We thank you that salvation is full and free. I pray for someone in this room today, God, who is looking for a mate to share life with. The young adults in this room, God, who are single and love you and are serving you, God, that the right person would show up in their life, that you would Bless them, Lord, in relationship. Bless them with the kind of covenant marriage that you've given Paula and I. Bless the marriages in this room, Lord. Restore, revive, renew hearts in this room, Lord. Let our families be stronger. Let our covenant be greater. Heal and make whole, God. And those that are struggling in their relationships, heal their hearts, God. Make them to be at one with you and at one with their own heart and life. Heal the broken. Bind up their heart, Lord. You're the heart mender. You're the heart keeper. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I bless you. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. I want you to go with this word today from Ephesians 5. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn their proper behavior from their parents, mostly what God does is love. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Look at somebody and say, I'm going to love like that. <laughs> Amen. It's a promise. It's a promise. Bless you. Have a great week. I love you. Thank you.